go. Hey everybody, happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. <laughs> welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. We got spiders, we got apes, we got assassins. What the hell happened today? <laughs> <laughs> also here is Dennis Zen. Yeah, normally on a Friday, we always like scrape in trying to get some good news. <laughs> news and then we have all these big trailers and then of course I see John over there is rocking his Star Wars thing. I'm rocking my Star Wars <laughs> oh, t-shirt. Oh no. You oh. forgot to wear yours. Now I feel bad. I'm, I'm saving it all for tomorrow. Yeah there because is. tomorrow What's night, tomorrow? Yeah. Tomorrow well, I don't know night, what you're talking about. What's tomorrow? Tomorrow night <laughs> John, Perry, myself, Christian, Ellis and a few other people. Uh, Wendy and uh <laughs> Tiffany, Tiff, Tiffany, coming with us. We're all going to the Rogue One premiere. Stop and making sad faces. Have a Roka. good time, guys. Yeah. Have a great time. Hey, so, you, <laughs> enjoy so you yourselves. You have a pretty good plan no, on no, Sunday no, no, night. No, Don't fair, complain. To be fair, I did. They did give me a like. I've got a plus one for Anne to yeah. come with me, but they gave me an extra plus one. However, it said no scarves. What? Uh, so, <laughs> I couldn't, so I couldn't invite Roka. So, 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 so if you're not bitter like Roka over there, you can you can you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, oh and Twitter, and, and check out the pictures. I it's gonna be a great time. I know you guys went last year. I'm looking forward to this. It's year. gonna be a lot of fun. Also here. <laughs> That's like the longest in driver. I liked it. I liked it. Also, yeah. here is John Roca. Yeah. Well, hi. Uh, this is so much fun. I can't wait. There's so much to talk about. Unfortunately, the Transformers trail is included, but everything else looks like it's going to be so much fun to talk about. Yeah, and I wore the scarf in honor of Perry requesting it last week. <laughs> and Perry Nemiroff. Hey, guys. And don't feel bad for Roca making sad faces over there. He's coming with me to the Critics' Choice Awards Sunday night. Oh, no gosh. scarfs allowed there, which is why you have to wear it now. That's true. Okay, well, look, like we said, there are a couple of trailers like dropped out of nowhere. We're all set and ready to talk about the Spider-Man trailer. Then all of nowhere comes the apes. But the one that dropped just a few minutes ago is actually the brand new trailer for Assassin's Creed. Dennis, you got a glimpse at this thing. You literally just watched yes. it like a minute ago. What do you think about this new trailer for Assassin's Creed? Well, seeing as last week we did a <laughs> review of a trailer that actually wasn't a real trailer, Oops. and we found yeah, and we found it, and we bashed that one to hell, and deservedly so. Yes. So of course my expectations are pretty low. I, I thought that was a decent one. I mean, I'm not going over the moon for it, but it, it actually comes from more of the perspective of the modern times, of the future times, coming back and going into it. And they're telling more of the story. Uh, the action in it looks pretty good, but it still looks very CG-like. I'm just concerned about how many people are still interested in this movie. I, I mm. it's It's... I don't know. I think the interest is starting to wane for some people, really? including myself. I mean, maybe just because Star Wars Rogue One is is so near its release date that that's did you mention it's tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, tomorrow. Yes, yeah, tomorrow. tomorrow. Us, yes. Um, maybe because that's around it, that cloud is around it, that it's going to have a hard time trying to get any type of attention. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, this is one of those classic cases of it's a shame. It might be too little, too late. I thought this was a very good trailer. It was, it's easily the best of the Assassin's Creed trailers. Tra tra I mean, I think easily, hands down, bar none, it is the best of the Assassin's Creed trailers. I think it's a very good trailer. It's the first one they put out that I watched and I went, okay, this movie I'm interested in. Now, I didn't hate the first trailer. A lot of other people did though. And this, I'm afraid this might be a case where, like I'm sitting here watching this trailer and the first thought through my head was, where the hell was this trailer a month ago? Mm -hmm. When people were first starting to form their opinions about whether or not they were interested in this movie, this was the first trailer that should have come out. Mm. This is a trailer that would have got people talking and I'm afraid that by putting out some subpar trailers before this one come, I'm afraid there's a lot of people out there have already made up their mind yeah. that they don't want to go see this. And that's a shame because I think this trailer deserves some attention. And I agree with you, Dennis. I am not feeling in my Twitter space, in my Facebook space, I'm not feeling a lot of excitement from people for Assassin's Creed, whereas we were all excited for it before the first couple of trailers came out. Will this trailer be enough to save it? 
Let's find out. Roka, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I love the trailer. I agree with you, John. I, I really think it's the best one of them that they've released. And you're looking at video game movies, right? You put When you put it in that context, this might be the greatest trailer of a video game movie ever made. It's so well-paced. It feels bigger than just a video game movie, which I liked. The fact that they start with Jeremy Irons and Charlotte Rampling, so you don't even see Fassbender until almost a minute into the trailer, yeah. which is really smart for them to do, I think, because it lets you know that they're treating this with a little more respect, a little more of, an, uh, of a, a bigger feel to the movie as opposed to like just what Warcraft felt like, which was let's, let's, hit the, let's hit the buttons, hit the points. We know who's going to come see this. This feels like they're trying to expand past the movie or the video game uh, audience. And I think that's really, really good. And you're right. There's a lot of stuff going on now that is kind of dousing the fire mm -hmm. of this. But I think once that settles down, people will get back psyched up for this again. Because if this is a good video game movie, which people have been clamoring about for decades about getting a good video game movie, I think this could really break the, the uh, break that mold once and for all and have a good, good one that people can use as a barometer going forward. And of course, we were saying that about Warcraft. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I never was. Yeah, no, no, yeah. we I were never saying was. that, but then like in the comment <laughs> section right now, someone's like, don't under underestimate the gamers. I'm like, but, we, but, just oh, okay. we just had don't Warcraft. Don't underestimate the gamers. You, okay, 0 for 40. Okay, <laughs> We're, right now the gamers are 0 for 40. So let's let's see if you, I mean, you weren't supporting anything else. So let's see if you support no. this. What do you think? I agree with you. As someone who does not know Assassin's Creed and know the backstory, the mythology, the rules, and all of that, if this trailer had come out first, I think I would have been a lot more excited at this yeah. point because... We're almost too late in the game for me to have gotten this. I've already seen so much action in so many locations and so many characters. Now they're like, oh, the apple does this and you must stop. This is the information I needed as a non-Assassin's Creed player when they first started. And had they used that as a stepping stone to then build and give me more information and catch me up to speed with all the gamers who are super psyched about this movie, I would be a little more excited. But in just assessing this trailer, it's well paced. It's well edited. I do like some of the visuals. I don't really like that the uh, something about the color palette and just the designs of the visuals does feel very Warcrafty to me, mm. which I find a little unappealing. Maybe yeah. because I didn't really like that movie, but. I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt right now. I do desperately want a good video game movie. I would not bet on this being it at this point, but that's not to say that I'm not still rooting for it. I want it to be good, but at this point, I've been doing so much reading on The Last of Us. I'm convinced that if that ever happens, <laughs> that's going to be the first good video game movie. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm a lot more hopeful now that this movie will be decent than I was 24 hours ago. I mean, that that's what this trailer did for me. It's given me some hope that this movie may actually work. Now, that wasn't the only big trailer that came out today. Sinead, what's next? 20th Century Fox has unveiled the first trailer for War for the Planet of the Apes, the third film in the rebooted prequel series following Rise of the Planet of the Apes and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Matt Reeves returns to direct with a story that picks up two years after Andy Serkis' Caesar battled amongst the apes thanks to the radical Koba. The story now continues in the thick of a war between the apes and humans. The film also stars Woody Harrelson, Steve Zahn, and Judy Greer, and it opens in theaters on July 14th, 2017. John, what do you think of the first trailer for War for the Planet of the Apes? <laughs> yeah! That's a good trailer. That's a great trailer because one of the things, you know, I think we mentioned it on a, a news segment we did recently, was like, look, there have been rumors about, you know, Koba and uh, coming back and all that kind of stuff. And I said, no, 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 he's not coming back. And we don't want him to come back. Yes, he was a great trailer. He, he was a great trailer. He was a great villain. Yes, Koba was a great villain and a great character. Yes, but it's time. We're in the third film. It's time to move on from the interpolitical problems with the apes themselves and move on to the war. It's time, it's the third film. And this trailer came. I wasn't expecting the trailer for a few more days, maybe even another week from now is what we kind of heard. It dropped and I'm watching it and I'm like this, look, I love the first two apes movies. I do, I think they're both great. Yeah. But this looks like the one that I've been wanting. <laughs> this looks like the ape film that we've all been waiting for. I got, you can't see it under my sleeves. I got goosebumps thinking about it. Caesar, that, that monologue by Caesar. It sounds not just angry, there's pain in his voice talking about, I didn't start this war. Like you can still tell, he doesn't even want the war. He, he wants humans and apes to get along. So there's pain and anger all mixed into one. The, the visuals are great. It was, I mean, Woody Harrelson, 
Hmm. Like, I, I remember, hey, I was one of the guys, full admission here, I was one of the guys and I heard, Woody Harrelson for this? It, I mean, I like Woody Harrelson very much, but this doesn't seem like, I take it back, he looks great. So I thought this trailer was spectacular. Dennis, what did you think? Yeah, I liked it a lot too. With me, Woody Harrelson, I, I actually liked his inclusion just because of what he had recently done in Out of the Furnace. He played that villain character. Also, we've seen him in Natural Born Killers. And what's the one so he just did with um, the, the teen movie? Uh, Something oh, of 17. Edge, edge of 17. 17. And he's yeah. great in he Edge is, of 17. So, so I liked his inclusion is that we don't see uh, Jason Clark and then that, that's like another human tie that, that uh, Caesar has lost. You know, he had uh, uh, James Franco's character in the first one. Right. He's no longer in the second one. And now in this one, doesn't appear that, that Jason Clark is there. So it seems like he's losing these, his ties to humanity slowly and slowly. And, and yeah, we've been waiting to see this big giant war. I just hope that there is still more relationship stuff that you know between whether it's caesar and, and some other apes or or some other human that that ties us to to what the consequences of this war are Mary? i am a big big fan of this trailer this after talking about assassin's creed and how that trailer should have been the first this right here is an example of a perfect first trailer and especially that opening line just just like the way you described it i did not start this war by saying that you recall everything that happened in the first two movies yeah. and what he went through while also paving the way to what winds up being a true war trailer i mean all those visuals are incredible and i think we are going to get more relationship bits between Caesar and some of the other apes because this trailer that's Maurice right the yes. other yeah. Ape, yeah. pretty heavily features Maurice where it's it's not even just Maurice in the midst of action there's a couple shots that are just close up of of like faces mm -hmm. that go to show that that ape is thinking about what's happening there is judging Caesar's judging what's happening around him I really, I really have the highest hopes for this movie. I love. Th I think this is going to be an excellent trilogy, which is so exciting. Yeah. Roger. Yeah, I mean, I echo what everyone said. It's just so good. It hits all the right notes. It's called War for the Planet of the Apes. War is in the title, so like John said, we want to see the war, and we certainly see it here. And if you analyze the trailer, break it down, watch a little bit more, you'll see there are gorillas helping the humans. What's that all about? Mm -hmm. How did that end up happening? You know, there's so much here, and you're right. I think what you said about Maurice Perry is, is spot on. He's always been the conscience, right? He's always been the guy yeah. who's been in the back, almost like the concierge, almost like the Spock mm -hmm. of this. Yeah, of, yeah, basically. Uh, Caesar, yeah. It's basically. Basically, the Spock of the situation, like trying to figure out, help him out, and all this kind of stuff, but always supporting him. And now we see something Caesar coming into his own as a leader. We've seen him through the first two movies, which is so ironic that we as humans are going to watch an ape. It's, it's so amazing how they've twisted this whole thing around with this iteration of the franchise, you know? And so it's fantastic that we have a great actor like Andy Serkis doing this, bringing him to life, and showing him. And we're totally going to have these relationships. And for what I understand, the Koba thing is, is like two years, it's two years later after the Civil War with Koba and all this. Kind of, so I don't know if we're He's, I don't think we're going to see him no, at we're all. Not see him. So it's good. You're right, John. Just shed that and let's move on. He's got to embrace himself as a lead. So what's it like now to fully lead without anyone to contradict him? And he has to take full responsibility for what he's going to do with ape kind and what he's going to do in this war. And Woody is awesome. And people need to stop putting Woody down in anything he's ever in. Woody always shows up. Woody always produces. When, in whatever he's in, he always shows up and does a great job. If you feel he's miscast on stuff, that's fair. But his work, you cannot question. And so he looks great in this film. Oh, he's a terrific mm -hmm. performer. All right, and that... <laughs> That wasn't even the biggest of the trailers to come out. So, hey, what's next? <laughs> Sony Pictures has released the first Spider-Man Homecoming trailer, offering our very first look at the Marvel and Sony co-production. The new film sees Peter Parker, played by Tom Holland, dealing with the growing pains that come with being a high school student while also having to fend off supervillains, all while trying to join the Avengers and impress Tony Stark. The film also stars Robert Downey Jr., Marissa Tomei, and Michael Keaton, and it opens on July 7, 2017. Dennis, your thoughts on the first trailer for Spider-Man Homecoming? coming yeah this this was awesome i i wasn't able to see any of the footage at hall h at comic-con this year so everything was brand new to me me and perry did a trailer review and reaction and they revealed quite a bit that i wasn't expecting i wasn't expecting to see the full-on vulture costume i thought maybe they'd hide it in shadows and wait for the next teaser trailer maybe they'd hide the robert downey jr cameo no he's front and center <laughs> he's a big part of this trailer even the last shot of him in the Iron Man suit going away with Spider-Man. So they're not yeah. hiding any of that stuff. I like the high school teen feel to it. The only mystery we kind of have going on now is with the Zendaya character. Is she or isn't she Mary Jane? 
the uh, Peter Parker and his sidekick, I forgot his name, they're they're staring at that one girl and checking her out. Liz. And, and, and Liz. And then it, Zendaya is the one who who comes in from the side, like making fun of them, saying they're losers. But she's not like dressed up like mm-hmm. this like super hot girl next door. She seems like the more like antagonistic kind of a little gothy. Yeah, mm-hmm. a little gothy and a little like emo, a little yep. um, you know, like maybe she likes Peter, but she's gonna make fun of him type of thing, like childhood uh, playground type of situation. Roca, uh, I mean, off the charts in love with this. Off the charts in love with this. Immediately as I saw this, I, all the other films faded away from me for Spider-Man. This is Spider-Man. This is Spider-Man. You can come at me all you want. This is my Spider-Man. He is exactly what I see, what I hear when I read the comics, what I've read for years and years and years. He has that tone. He has that vibe. He has that high school feel to him. Just the reaction of Tom Holland when Zendai calls him out and he goes... Like, that's just a great moment. And the great moment in the car when the hug, like, they do a great job of, and Robert Downey Jr. is the perfect person to chaperone him into the Marvel Universe and into another iteration of Spider-Man that we are going to gravitate to. And people complain, oh, it's another reboot, it's another reboot. Sure, but if they get it right, I don't care. And it feels like they got it right in this. Vulture looks fantastic. I I thought they were going to go with the classic look and shave Keaton's head and have the nose and all this jazz, and they didn't do any of that. He looks more violent more vicious and in the international trailer you see even more of him yeah. and then we have Shocker at the beginning so we don't know how that's going to work out uh, you know and the, just the whole beginning of that trailer where he's making fun of the event the, those guys dressed up the <laughs> Avengers masks that's Spider-Man and they're just so funny and he's so easy to gravitate to Tom Holland his voice his presence his physique even when he takes off the shirt and he's all muscly and you know my god he's been working out uh, you you love it because he's a cute he's a kid just trying to find his place in the world and when he says I don't want to be treated like a kid he, he means it and the and the the web wings <laughs> I, i'm just all aboard all over it perry i absolutely loved this trailer it is i think it's the best of the three it most certainly did not make war fade away for me <laughs> i still love that to death but oh this trailer so far exceeded my expectations for my first look because i was with dennis i didn't get to see anything mm. in uh in hall h at comic-con this is my first look at this and I wrote down just like a whole list of things that I noticed and that I'm so excited about. One of the things I kept bringing up is when we saw Spider-Man in Civil War, I didn't like the eye movements because it felt too Mm. digital to me. Here, however, I, I don't know what changes they made, but it's so well integrated into the suit now. That works for me. Tom Holland as this character, really, I don't think there could could have been better casting. And mm. that's coming from someone who was a fan of both Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield. I think they did what they did well with that character, but Tom Holland, the way he carries himself and he walks and the way the way he interacts with uh, with Tony Stark, the way he interacts with all the other kids in the high school, that, that has a very different feel. And I'm kind of with you. So, something feels more right about mm-hmm. this than any other iteration of the character. But Everything in this looked great. The way this thing was cut together too made me really happy. I said this when Guardians dropped earl- earlier this, wow, was that earlier this week? Yeah. Oh my God, we got so many trailers this week, I can't handle it. And most of them were really good. Um, Guardians showed us a good deal, but it gave us a couple of scenes that obviously weren't complete scenes, but they were scenes that we saw a lot of and could hold on to as memorable moments. Mm. That's what this trailer does also. It did it with the bank heist at the beginning with the Avengers mask. Mm. It did it with with the scene in the high school that Dennis was talking about where they're looking at the hot girl. It did it in in his bedroom where his friend finds out he's (laughs) Spider-Man. It did it in the car when they have that that awkward hug moment. Uh, There's so many things I love about this trailer. I cannot wait to see more footage it's a good trailer (laughs) it's a good trailer i liked it it's it's a good trailer i I will admit i wasn't jumping up and down out of my seat but i thought it was very good and i thought it was especially very good for a first trailer now i thought i was thinking a little bit differently than you dennis Mm -hmm. i'm actually surprised that tony stark wasn't in more oh really (laughs) just not from a creative point of view Mm. from a marketing Mm. point of view I, Tony Stark, Iron Man, draws box office dollars, so you knew they were going to put him in there. I really did like that scene when he's in the car. No, this isn't a hug. I'm opening the door for you. Yeah. Um, that was great. I thought both the international version and the North American version were very, very good. It almost felt to me like the North American version was, was advertising a John Hughes teen comedy, yeah. which is great. And I felt like the international version was, was promoting the an action Spider-Man movie uh, on, a, on a big level like that. And both of those are great. They were both wonderful and really, really solid. I love Michael Keaton is so menacing. Yeah. 
My, he just had like two lines in that thing. But the way, like every villain says, I'll kill you and everybody you love. Every villain in history has ever said it, but not every villain in history can say it like Michael can. Right. And that was the really, really big key of it. Keaton, the way he delivers that, it sounds great. There's some really good shots in there. And you know, the idea of going back to the teenage Peter Parker, I've always been a fan of that idea because not only is it cool to go back to the true origins of the character, but it gives us a chance, it gives Marvel the chance to really honestly do Spider-Man with this one actor for the next 12 to 15 years yeah, yeah. if they want to. Now, I'm fine with older iterations of Spider-Man too because a lot of people in my generation and younger, like I started reading Spider-Man during the Scarlet Spider stuff when Peter mm -hmm. Parker had his clone, Ben Parker, and that stuff. And by that time, he's older, he's married, he's all that kind of stuff. For a, lo a lot of people forget there's a long set of years where Spider-Man was an adult, where mm -hmm. Spider-Man was an adult Peter Parker. But I do love that they're changing those gears. You're right, man. He feels like he's in high school. Yep. He fe it feels authentic and real. Yeah. I loved Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man. Yeah. I never bought him walking down a high school hall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right? Or 31-year-old right. Tobey <laughs> no, Maguire no, walking no, down no. a high school. No. Never bought that. This feels like a kid in high school. It, it They said for a long time it's going to be like a John Hughes comedy. It felt like a John Hughes comedy, and it's going to have all those elements. Mm -hmm. I think this movie is going to be ter terrific, but I'm going to ask all of you at the table here. I'll call it a would you rather kind of thing, but let's mm -hmm. just say, which one did you prefer? There are two, I think, Assassin's Creed, good trailer, best trailer put out. I think it's safe to say the none, two none, best none trailers are Spider-Man yeah. and the Apes. Dennis, which one was better to you, the Spider-Man or the Apes trailer? It's Spider-Man, for sure. I mean, I, I unfortunately watched the Spider-Man one first and then the War for the Planet of the Apes, which I also loved as well. But because I was so hyped off the Spider-Man one, that easily for me is what, what I prefer. What about you, Roka? Which I, one did you prefer? I can't put them in a vacuum. So for me, I have to say Spider-Man because I wasn't sure how they were going to do this. And the last two times they tried to do this Spider-Man property and franchise, it kind of crashed and burned on the last installments. So I was worried that they wouldn't come out with a great trailer, and they did. And the first two Planet of the Apes trailers are fantastic, so I had no worries that that third one was going to be fine. And it's great, but this, there's just something about getting it 100% right, a character that you have loved since you were in your pajama, baby pajamas, your underoos, your Spider-Man underoos, and I think they really nail it here. Plus having the Bruce Banner in the high school shot, if you notice, in the back, a picture of Bruce Banner, and Tony Stark's father in the mural in the back in the high school shot when they're in the lunchroom all of that just it just does the right tones and Planet of the Apes nailed it but Spider-Man just for me because I love that character so much I, I really did enjoy the Spider-Man trailer I yeah. know the movie's gonna be great you could feel because a lot of people forget we talk about Sony Spider-Man yeah. we think Spider-Man 3 and we think the amazing Spider-Man 2 don't forget Sony gave us Spider-Man 1 true Spider-Man 2 one of the best comic book movies mm -hmm. ever made Agreed. and the first the amazing Spider-Man which is great seeing you can totally see with the two international trailers the Marvel and the Sony influences in there making a teen comedy, but lots of action at the same time. I think we're gonna get a great movie, but the Planet of the Apes trailer knocked it out of the park for me. I'm, I'm gonna go Planet of the Apes trailer. What about you? I think it's impossible to compare the two given the fact that the tone and the subject matter are just so, so drastically different, yeah. different. So all I can do to judge is based on my excitement level and I think Spider-Man just edged out uh, War for the Planet of the Apes. All right, so we're gonna put this to you guys right now. We're gonna put up a Twitter poll right now. Go over to our Twitter, make sure you're following us at Collider Video and we've put up a poll for you. We wanna know. Which trailer of the two brand new ones, the Spider-Man trailer or the Planet of the Apes trailer, did you prefer? We've got that trailer, up, that post up right now. So go and vote. We'll check in with Wendy near the end of the show to see what you guys are saying and how you are voting. We'll check out on that poll a little bit later. All right, what is next? Via an exclusive from comicbook.com, a new poster for next year's Power Rangers has been released online, offering our very first look at the Zords. The giant assault vehicles piloted by the Rangers can also combine to form the humanoid robot known as Megazord. Meanwhile, another image of Rita Repulsa was also tweeted from the official account, giving us another look at Elizabeth Banks' villain, Lionsgate. Looks as though they will continue to offer up new looks at the movie as we get closer to its March 24th, 2017 release. Perry, what did you think of our first look at the Zords from Power Rangers? All right, first, before I get to that, let's get Rita Repulsa out of the way because, okay, she looks good. I've seen enough images of her at this point. Right now, I want to discover more about this movie, but I don't want to discover more about her. I got my look <laughs> at her costume. It's done. Move on. Show me something new. This poster, I like it. I like the idea behind it, and I, I like the, the teasing nature of it. 
And I think the Zords do look pretty good in terms of what we could see from them right now. However, I look at this and just, you know, from an artistic perspective, this isn't a design I would want to hang on my wall. And I really just think it's a matter of, I don't know, maybe a little less fog or, or different positioning <laughs> of the Zords. But but to me, this this just isn't a pretty picture. And when I see posters and I get excited about posters, it's because I want to frame them and hang them on my wall. And while this does, you know, get me a little more excited for the Power Rangers movie, I don't want to frame and hang this on my wall. Um. I, I don't think the poster's that great. Uh, I mean, the, to me, the Zords, I've been looking forward to seeing what the Zords look like because, surprise, surprise, I think I liked the Power Rangers trailer more than anybody else in our office. <laughs> I actually, I, you know, I think it's a terrible idea for a movie. I quite enjoyed the trailer. I was pleasantly surprised by it. So I've been looking forward to seeing what approach they took with the Zords. Right, look, it's just a trailer, or sorry, it's just a poster, an obscure poster at that. Like, it's, it's a lot of it's in fog, whatever. They look really cartoony to me. So I'm not a big fan of that. So, and here's the other thing too. I'm, careful, I'm gonna be careful of what I say here, but you know, I my expectations for Power Rangers turned around with the trailer. I really did like the trailer to my shock and surprise. However, I am now not hearing good things. Mm. Oh no. I am now not hearing good things about the movie. But who knows? Who who knows? <laughs> let's hold on and, and, and see what, what happens. We'll you get a chance to see for ourselves. <laughs> what do you think, Roka? Color me shocked. Uh, no, I, I had a feeling that would end up happening at some point. Um, I think they're, the, the reason they're focusing on Rita Repulsa and Elizabeth Banks, she's their name. She's their name that they're trying to put up front. And, uh, of course, and she looks great. Yeah, she looks great. The uh, outfit looks great. I think she's going to be fine. Um, I actually like this picture of the Zords. I, I I don't have as much of a tie to this property or franchise as other people do, as I've said numerous times on the show. So I like this look. It's really cool. I would buy this toy if I own if I could get it. You know, no 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 issues there. It has a little bit of the vibe, and I may be off on this, of that uh, uh, the RoboCop that microphone looking thing that stomped around and killed and shot those people out the window. So it's got a little bit of that vibe to it. But I still like the the approach to it, and it has a little Dinobots thing going on there too. Mm in its approach so you they're they're smartly touching just a little bit on what they know could get people in the theater people like me in the theaters anything that remotely resembles transformers i'm gonna go so i i'm actually kind of excited a little more now from seeing the zords poster as opposed to the Rita repulsive poster because like you're right perry we've seen enough of her perry. you had to pull transformers into I'm, it though, I'm didn't just you? Saying, <laughs> you can tell <laughs> perry when when you you do look at the zords though themselves yeah. like we, we know where your expect your hopes are where your expectations are did, what about just the design of the Zords themselves? As somebody who's kind of looking forward to the movie, what did you think about just the design from what you see? As someone who grew up addicted to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, it's hard, it's the same thing when they revealed that concept art of Alpha 5. It's hard to look at that and not be like, ugh, th th that's not my version of this. However, I am a huge, huge fan of that trailer. I have grown to like what the new Power Rangers suits look like. Those have to match the design of everything else. Mm. And I think the design of those suits matches what I can see so far of these Zords. So it looks appropriate to I, me. I think you're right, actually. That's a really good point. Dennis, what do you think about this whole thing? Uh, I actually <laughs> like with you, John. I quite enjoyed that trailer. It was much different than what I was expecting. They take, took a little more serious tone with it. With uh, Elizabeth Banks and Rita Repulsa, Roka, you're right. They, she's the big name mm. on this cast because most of the cast are like smaller lesser known actors so they're they're gonna put her front center she looks like she's having a good time yeah. you know posing in all these different suits as far as that other poster goes it looks like concept art to me usually when you look mm, through concept yeah. art that's what it is and i know a lot of people get mad at me look i didn't grow up in the power power rangers era when that was a big thing I am a Voltron person. And when I look at that, I see yellow lion, red lion. I see, I see, I see like, that's what I see. I'm, they're they're going to form into Voltron soon. So th you that's bastards. what I mean. yeah, you yeah. bastards. All right, folks, we reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Sinead's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Sinead, what do we got? In an interview with EW, producer Simon Kinberg spoke a bit about the sequel to Deadpool that recently revealed its new director to be John Wick co-director David Leitch. After Tim Miller exited the project over creative differences, fans wondered if the spirit and style from the first movie would be different in the planned follow-up. Kinberg put those fears to rest, explaining that Deadpool 2 is aiming to maintain the exact scale of the first film. 
We have to resist the temptation to make it bigger in scale and scope, which is normally what you do when you have a surprise hit movie. But actually, stay true to the tenets of its tone and the style and the humor that make it so special. It's not the explosions and the special effects. Roka, do you buy or sell Deadpool 2 repeat, repeating the small scale found in the first? Yeah, I absolutely buy this. I think this is a great approach. Yes, don't go too far. Don't go too much. The thing we love about Deadpool is he's he's in a small situation and small everything on the ground. I love that. Keep him where he's at. Have him have fun. Reestablish him even more. I love that the screenwriters, uh, Paul Wernick and Rhett Reese, are coming back. They understand the tone of the film. I think his concern is correct. They had 10 years to get this first one right. They don't have that amount of time to get the second one right. So there is some kind of danger going forward. But I think they've found the right director. I think if they keep in communication, they'll understand what they need to do. So to me, going in, knowing that it's going to be small scale, it makes me happy. I don't want him doing these massive things yet. You don't need a Civil War Deadpool yet. We just need to establish him a little bit more and understand that this wasn't a fluke. We don't want this to be a fluke, and if you come out with an even better second movie that expands it a little bit but doesn't go too far, I think we're going to be even more excited to see a third one that will expand it. This is a, a big buy. Part of the th reason yeah. that Deadpool works so well was the charm of the smaller scale. Yeah, you can do bigger scale with Deadpool later, but you're going to lose some of that charm or whatever, and we're going to see him in something bigger later. You can add a couple more characters, which I'm sure they're going to do, but maintain that charm. It's the right move for me. It's a buy. I'm definitely with you as well. Big buy for me. I don't really understand and why, I mean, I guess I do understand why the mentality with sequels is to go bigger and potentially lose what made you so special to begin with, except for the fact that I, I guess money and trailers and boom and look at this, get more butts and seats that way. It still doesn't make any sense to me, though, and I think it, it would do a disservice to the original. So I am glad they are taking the exact opposite approach because when I walked out of Deadpool, I didn't walk around telling everybody, look at the scale of this movie, look at the crazy action. I said, look at this incredible character yeah. that Ryan Reynolds created that is so irreverent, and, and yet, like, I, I connected with him, and it was, it was an emotional movie. It was just the balance of all that, the tone and the style. That is what made that movie special. So if that's the priority, they are on the right track. Dennis. Yeah, I buy it. I agree with a lot of what you guys have been saying. It, it's one of those things where sequels always try and outdo themselves, so they try and bigger, do a bigger danger. So I don't want to see Deadpool fighting an alien invasion. That's not what Deadpool is mm -hmm. about. What we actually cared about was his relationship with Vanessa, and that's what yeah. made it more relatable. So as long as they don't stray away from that, I don't mind it a smaller budget. Maybe give him a little bit more money, but, but it doesn't need to be like this big thing where it's like an epic crossover superhero universe type of thing. Just keep it small. All right, what's next? The first trailer for Doug Liman's The Wall has landed online. The movie centers on two soldiers pinned down in the middle of the desert by an Iraqi sniper with nothing but a crumbling brick wall for cover. The film stars Aaron Taylor Johnson and John Cena and will be released on March 10th, 2017. Dennis, do you buy or sell the new trailer for Doug Liman's The Wall? I buy it. I was su surprised. You know, you hear John Cena's in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> We, yeah. we, you know, and I've liked him when I've seen him, but he's been only doing comedic roles, at least for, so far what doing I've seen. Doing them kind of well. Yeah, he does them yeah. well, like yeah. Trainwreck and, and Sisters. <laughs> and so to see him in this role, I thought he did a pretty good job. And it's Doug Liman, who was supposed to direct Gambit, uh, his last movie, Edge of Tomorrow, I think most people really enjoyed. This seems like a smaller film. You have even that moment with the communications thing where he's like, he figures out it's 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 actually the sniper, kind of like one of those those scream moments where it's like, oh, the call is coming from inside the house. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to this. this is, I think an Amazon Studios mm -hmm. project, so I don't know if they're going to release it in theaters or if it's just purely going to be online. Mm. Rocco. Yeah, loved it. So much more. I mean, you know, the affinity there, having served eight years, you know, you have certain war films, certain war films come out and you're like, are they going to get this right? Are they really going to get the vibe down? And this feels like it does. And this feels, and a Doug Lyman, I love to pieces. I love just about everything he's ever directed. So I'm a big fan of him. And this looks, he's like, he's going small again, which he really does well. And John Cena, what a shock as a fan of professional wrestling for decades to see John Cena coming out of the Marine and all these other kind of made for him type, not really trying to make a big deal of this type of, to see him step up and be in a film like this and be believable in every scene I see him in in this trailer is really fantastically well thing I don't know fantastically awesome for me but to see and to see um, Aaron Taylor Johnson tackle another role build his resume even more I like him as an actor I think in Godzilla you could take or leave some of the stuff he did but he has a good resume that he's building and I think this is another opportunity to show and it has that jarhead vibe to it which I'm really excited about
Okay, so here's the thing. I, I, I buy the trailer. I do. Mm -hmm. I, I was, it would color me a little bit surprised. But look, <laughs> this is a great example of a guy, take John Cena, right? Yeah. Who was not, was not an actor, but we forget it's been like 11 years. It was about 11 years ago that he decided that he knew at some point his wrestling career is going to be over. He saw what The Rock was starting to do. Mm -hmm. He wanted to train and get himself better and learn and work and work. And he's been doing it for over a decade to mm -hmm. prepare for this. And we've seen him take little role, little role, and getting better and better. I'm t his train wreck thing, that could yeah. have <laughs> been a disaster. Him trying to do that stuff. Because if I read that script and tried to imagine John Cena doing it, other than the fact that he's physically good for the part, I, I thought, no, this is going to go south. Mm -hmm. He did it great. And then we see him pop up in Sisters, and he did it great. And I'm on board with him now. I'm on board to try with him now. And this trailer added to that faith. So call me surprised. It's a buy. Bye. And smart move for him, too, because this this is a small film, and it seems like it is primarily just the two of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you do want to expand your abilities, learn a little more, get more experience, what a great way. Because I'm sure he got the chance to work really closely with Aaron Taylor Johnson and Doug Lyman during the production of this when there's so few players in the mix. So this is probably a good stepping stone for him to take bigger roles in other movies also. But... This trailer shocked me. I can't believe how much I love this. And I love the way it was shot, too. Um, I think the, the cinematographer who did Suicide Squad is the guy who shot this also. And the, the style that they went with is spot on. And Aaron Taylor Johnson is easily one of my favorite actors out there right now. I have... I've never seen a movie where he's not good in it. I've seen movies where I think his role could have been written in a different way to mm -hmm. use his abilities more, but having just seen him in Nocturnal Animals, wow, that guy is talented, and I can't wait to see what he does with John Cena in this. All right, what's next? According to a report from MakingStarWars.net, it appears that Supreme Leader Snoke, played by Andy Serkis, will be brought to life via a practical effect. The report mentions that for at least part of episode eight, a seven or eight foot tall puppet will be operated by several people in order to get him to walk. If the report turns out to be true, it would mark a very different approach to the character who was first brought to life by motion capture technology in The Force Awakens. John, buy or sell a practical FX version of Snoke in Star Wars episode eight. I'm going to sell it. It's difficult because I don't know the entire context. I don't know the context. I'm sure we will see it in context and understand. But just on its surface, I'm going to sell it. You gave us a really good CG character. You're not going to be able to give that level of life to him with a practical puppet. No. You, you just can't. You can't. So, but again, that's out of context. What would they be using the puppet for? What would they be using this, this effect for? Until we have those answers, it's very, very difficult. So all I can say is on the surface is I'll sell it. What do you think? Yeah, I have to sell it. The concept of it, I have to sell it and agree with just about everything John said. But the fact that it's, you know, episode seven was so well done and the way JJ was able to combine the practical effects with CGI in an effective way, I have hope that they're doing it correctly. This whole idea of a seven or eight foot tall puppet operated by several people makes me go a little bit, but I have faith in them. However, as a CGI, as an FX version, I have to sell this uh, this concept. Dennis. Nah, I'm going the opposite way. I'm buying this. I want them to make a <laughs> practical effect. I, I remember watching Force Awakens and, and when Snow came out, it was like, because everything else had, had been, he'd been using a lot of practical effects for the, all the puppets and all the creatures and everything. And seeing that, that digital version of Snow kind of like threw me out a little bit. But the best thing about it is, remember it was a hologram. Right. So it's easy, like if, if they show Snoke in episode eight as himself in person, it's a, it's a, it's a much easier transition to do. It's not like they showed him in person <laughs> as a CG character and then next they showed him in person as a practical character. This is like, okay, they can kind of throw it away with that whole, it's a hologram thing. Barry? I'm gonna buy it as well, but with the concerns that both of you brought up. I'm kind of on the fence right now yeah. because I was not a big fan of the way Snoke looked in Force Awakens, but I gave it a pass because he was a hologram and because that's what he needed to look like in order to sell that. 
I much prefer practical to digital almost almost all the time. I'm not going to completely knock visual effects, but I do like when things look like something that I can reach out and touch. And I don't care if you put something in 3D when it's completely digital like that. I mean, it's like Fantastic Beast. I love that movie. Had a lot of fun with it. Those creatures, they they looked digital to yeah. me. So I want more practical always. In this case, though, I, I just have those same questions. I don't know what they're going to do with this. I'm curious to know what the thought process was with this also, because I know a lot of people had a similar reaction as, as I did to Snoke in Force Awakens. So I'm kind of curious to know if maybe they they took that into account and maybe they're going to incorporate more puppetry and, and what else you need to complete that character. And, and what are all those people doing? Because obviously eight foot, an eight foot tall character is a tall character, yeah. but... What do, what do you need all those those people? Like, what, what else is there to Snoke that you need so many people to operate him? All right, what's next? According to a recent interview with The Mummy director Alex Kurtzman, there was an original plan to keep a male version of The Mummy villain for the Universal Monsters reboot. It was when Kurtzman saw the post credit scene featuring a young apocalypse at the end of X-Men Days of Future Past, where he realized that his idea for the design of the mummy was almost exactly that of Apocalypse. Here's, what's, here's what Kurtzman told Cinema Blend. I was going down that road, and then I saw the end of Days of Future Past. And they had the character that Oscar Isaac wound up playing as a boy, and it was, I kid you not, the exact same design. And I was like, oh man, that is not good. And actually, it was the catalyst. It was the moment of, okay, not only is this not going to be different enough, Brian Singer just did it. I definitely don't want to go down that road. Perry, do you buy or sell the decision to make the mummy female and not male as originally intended? How can you not buy this story? He saw a movie that essentially did something that was very similar to what he was planning on doing, and he scrapped the idea, rethought it, and now we're going to get a, a more original concept for it. So I, I like the idea of this. I'm liking everything I'm hearing and seeing about The Mummy to this point. It seems like they are going about it the right way. And every single time I hear a quote from anybody involved in this process, it's, it's saying things like the one I highlighted here, is but what it ultimately comes down to is what feels right and it seems like that's the route everybody's going in I mean one of my favorite featurettes I've seen all year is the behind the scenes featurette that they dropped right after this trailer and everything they said in that featurette everything I saw in that featurette is what I want out of this movie I think this is the way they needed to go smart decision I'm going to sell it. I think, look, if you're a filmmaker and you're a visionary and you have a vision, look, no matter what idea you come out with, somebody else at some point in the 100-year history of Hollywood <laughs> did something similar. <laughs> if you thought this was your number one best idea for the character, stick to your guns and stick to your character. Look, I'm excited to see Sofia Batella as a mummy as well. I, I think it is more original to see that. We've never seen something like this before. I'm excited to see it. I am. But if you're the filmmaker and you put a year into the thinking of it and you thought, this is my idea, don't be thrown off just because you find out later somebody else did something a little bit similar. And it was a two second shot in a post credit scene. Who cares? So I'm excited for Sofia Botella. I am. Yeah. But I think as a filmmaker, he should have stuck to his guns. I sell it. Roka. I absolutely buy it. I think it's a smart move. You saw what you saw what you you saw that you were going to be imitating people. And you know, it kind of is prescient because People tore Apocalypse uh, apart for what it looked like, for what uh, Oscar Isaac looked like in that uh, garb and that but outfit. But that's so, different from the from the boy in the post credit scene right. of mm -hmm. Days of Future Past. Right, but you you have that you have still Days of Future. You have that connection to it. And I think for me, I think it's so. This is a creative process. As a creative person, sometimes you have to adjust midstream. You have to swallow your pride. You have to make changes. And this seems like it worked out well because Butella is fantastic. She already looks great in this part. It gives a whole other vibe to it. You don't have anything else like connected to anything else it seems this seems exclusive in its way and the way they're setting up the universe and i think patel is a great choice for it so it's a happy accident which happens in movies all the time any great filmmaker will tell you that it's happy accidents along the process that brought us to this point who knows if it'll work it might be a crappy movie she might be terrible in it but i think this is i think this was a smart move by him he saw he read the tea leaves and said nope i'm gonna make a change mid midstream and i like it Dennis. yeah i buy it i i think that he didn't have to change the look, just seeing that little thing, but I'm glad he did because the version that he has now is much better than that. Like the one in the in the the trailer that we just saw, that it just looks she looks m much more intimidating. Mm -hmm. It looks looks more unique than what 
in Sabanur kind of looked like. That was great for that particular scene. We knew that character wasn't going to be the apocalypse that we knew in uh, in apocalypse right. movie. So I, I don't know. I, I, I'm he didn't have to, but I'm glad he did. All right. Well, it is Friday, which means it's time for us to give our box office predictions brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. I haven't done this in a while, so I'll step out into the shark-infested water first. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be straightforward with you. At number one is going to be Moana again. Moana will stay at number one. I think number two, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, will stay at number two. However, then we got a new entry. I think Christmas Party is going to come in at number three. Doctor Strange and then The Arrival. So I'm going to go Doctor Strange for the arrival at number five. That's my call. Dennis, what about you? Uh, I have Moana at number one, but I actually have Office Christmas Party at number All two. Right. Uh, Fantastic Beasts. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of repeat business, but it, it's not like the Harry Potter movies where people are just clamoring to re-see these movies over and over again. So I think it's a drop at number three. I mean, Arrival is a surprise to me. Not because I didn't like the movie. I thought it one of, one of my favorite movies of the year. But just watching it, I didn't expect such a, a, a open reaction, uh, like a positive reaction mm -hmm. from the masses of people. It's just hanging on in there. It yeah. keeps being in there in the top five. And then Doctor Strange, a lot of repeat business for that at number five. Roka. Okay, I have Moana at number one. Who doesn't? Uh, I, I, I agree with Dennis. Office Christmas Party at number two. Uh, Fantastic Beasts it isn't getting the repeat business that the Harry Potter movies do. I like I saw it twice now already. I enjoy it, but I know there's been clamors on the boards. Having worked at Harry Potter, uh, there, there's a lot of problems. People have issues with it. I think Arrival at four, fantastic. I actually think Allied is still holding on at five for some unknown reason, but I'm mm -hmm. going to put them at five. Strange is starting to drop out a little more. It's doing more internationally than domestically, so it makes sense. And I, I So that's why I leave it off at number six. What I actually think? have a different number one. I'm going office Christmas party as number one <laughs> really? because Thursday night numbers came in. They say it's outpacing Sisters. Sisters opened with, I think, like between 13 and 14 million last year, but it opened against an Alvin and the Chipmunks movie and Force Awakens. Office Christmas party is opening wide pretty much all by itself. So I think it's going to be close between that and Moana, but I'm giving the edge to office Christmas party. So Moana number two, Fantastic Beast number three. I'm going to put Arrival at number four, which is killing it right now, and it's getting more theaters this week too. And then I'm, I'm with you. I'm going Allied because the one that screwed up my prediction last week was picking <laughs> Doctor Strange over Allied, which folks seem to like. And I finally got around to seeing it this week, and you know now, now I'm probably going to go tell people to see it. I liked it's, it. It was solid. Yeah. It was solid. It's, it's not quite the thriller that it they make it out to be <laughs> okay guys we are running a little bit over time so we're going to bypass mailbag don't worry we'll get to those questions on another show next week but we're going to go right to twitter because we would like to make sure that we save some time for you guys who are watching us live if you want to get a question in just make sure you're following us on twitter at collider video send on in those questions now wendy's going to pick a couple out but i do want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show going up on Collider Video today. A little bit later, a brand new movie trivia showdown. We got Schneider versus Chris Stuckman. A little bit later today, keep your eyes open for that. We also had trailer reactions coming today. Uh, Dennis, which trailer reactions do we have coming today? We have the Spider-Man one. Me and Perry did that one. And we also have the War of the Planet of the Apes with okay. Ken Napsok and Wendy Lee. Nice. And uh, you'll keep your eyes open this weekend. Of course, we've got two episodes of Mailbag coming this weekend. We've got the Walking Dead coming. Is it the mid-season finale? Mid-season yep. finale. Mid -season you're finale. joining us. I'm going to be on it. Nice. Jeremy Johns <laughs> is going to be on it. Joining Dennis yeah. and who else is, is there? That's a it because uh, the, 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 the regular cast <coughs> right here yeah. are, are, are going to be somewhere else. I don't know. We're going to be at the Critics' Choice Awards. That Having we a will. Good time. Thinking about you guys. Though. Okay. <laughs> Actually, that's a pretty good thing to go to. Yeah. I like that. All right, guys, let's do it. Let's get to these Twitter questions. Wendy, before we get into the questions, we put up a poll a little bit earlier asking you guys, which of the two trailers did you like the best between the Spider-Man trailer and the War of the Planet of the Apes? Wendy, what's the result so far? It's actually pretty close. We have Spider-Man just slightly edging out at 56%, and we have mm. War for the Planet of the Apes at 44%. Closer than I thought so it would be. Come on, Planet of the Apes. We're going to keep that poll up for the next 24 hours, guys. So if you're watching this show after it's been broadcast live, you can still go to our Twitter, just at Collider Video, and you'll see that poll there pinned to the top, and you can cast your vote. And we'll revisit the results on Monday. Okay, now let's get to your Twitter questions. Wendy, what are people asking? The first one comes from Nolan Dean, who writes, On Spider-Man Homecoming, what villain would you want to see on screen? I'd love to see Mysterio played by Zachary Quinto. 
Um, no, I'm not into Mysterio. I, I never have been really. I mean, Spider-Man's got a great rogues gallery of villains, a wonderful gallery of villains. I love, and you know what? I didn't like the idea of Vulture. Didn't mm. like it. I'm on board now. I mean, I didn't like it at the time. Um, look, at some point, you got. I think you got to bring Doc Ock, obviously, back. You At some point, you have to bring Goblin back. Uh, and re reintroduce them to this new world, but there's a there's a long list. But I'm very happy at this point now that I've seen the trailer. Very happy with would, the Vulture. Would you bring uh, Paul Giamatti back as Rhino? Oh, of course! <laughs> <laughs> yes! Oh my God! Go to run you over I'm with the Rhino, Rhino thing. <laughs> Can I answer this? Can I answer this? Yes, please. Craven. Please, oh, Craven. Craven, the hunter. Yes, he needs to. Craven is so good. Please, they not keep in this movie, overlooking though. it. Well, no, not in this. But maybe in the future, you got to bring Craven on. He'd be great. Dennis? I mean, Venom, I would love to see Venom mm -hmm. done correctly. He yeah. was, it was yeah. an abomination of, of what they did to him in Spider-Man 3. That was not Venom at all. Either do Venom correctly, or I've always been a big fan of Hobgoblin. You know, just oh, the yeah. look of yeah. Hobgoblin versus Green Goblin. I was going to say Venom as well, because we, we need a better version of that character. That's not fair. But <laughs> mo most of all, I just want them to keep the focus on Vulture in this movie. And in any subsequent movies that pop up, you know, let's just stick with one or at least make one the focus. I actually think we didn't even bring this up. There was um, Donald Glover and Logan Marshall Green in that trailer. There's one quick little shot yep. of mm. the two of them. So if you want to go find it and pause a whole bunch of times, you can see it. Oh. Okay, what's next? Sterling Jones writes, what's the percentage that we'll see Koba in War for the Planet of the Apes? I say 75%. Absolute zero. Absolute <laughs> zero. Uh, the, it was the director of the film that came out and made some Matt comments. Uh, yeah, came out the other day and basically said, nope, it's, he's not, he's dead. Koba is dead, so zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah agree. Agree. one percent, you know, <laughs> one percent that he might be lying. Yeah, but yeah, pretty much. And, and you there's know, no I, reason for him to come. No, back. no reason. And I, again, it's because I don't want Koba back. Yeah. It's time to move on from that story and move on to the war. And 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 bring Koba back would just play count up. But they, mm -hmm. and no uncertain terms, said no. He died. Yeah. Koba he's, died. He's so. too small of a villain for where they're going to next. Yeah, they totally agree. Villain, yeah. All right, what's next? Corey Scott Johnson writes, what do you guys think about them using a lot of the Miles Morales Spider-Man story for Peter Parker's Spider-Man? Totally fine. I mean, we've seen lots of, of comic book movies borrow iterations of stories from other runs or even other titles to incorporate into their story. Spider-Man is their property. And if they just say, hey, you know what? This story that we did that we happen to use with this character within our story, we think that story element would work well here. They do it in every comic book movie. So if they do that, and I don't know for sure that they are, but if they do... I have no problem with it. It makes sense to me, Roka. Yeah, I have no problem with it either. Like you said, John, it's their property, their franchise. They can do what they do. And Miles Morales is going to. It's not going to do it. Miles Morales is great. Everybody, there's certainly a lot of people that love Miles Morales. But Peter Parker is the known name, so that's what you're going to go with. Maybe down the road, if you do it right and you can shoot, you can show that you can do multiple movies in this franchise and keep it alive, keep it fresh. Then you can introduce the Miles, Miles Morales. We see that in the Flash show. We see them introducing Wally West and all these different characters. It can work if you establish a foundation of trust with the audience. Then at that point, and then you can rejigger his his intro as you see fit. But for me, I think this is fine. Perry. I have no attachment to the source material here. So from my perspective, all I care about is what I get in the final cut of a film. If it works as a film, I'm a happy person. In terms of them adding him to the mix later down the line, again, I'm primarily a fan of keeping the focus narrow because especially when it comes to big superhero movies, when you start going off in a million different directions, mm. that's when you tend to spiral out of control. Des? I mean, it's normal. M movies and televisions, especially when they're based on something like this, where there's like a rich history of background, they're going to pull the stories and characters that they feel best, whether or not it's from, you know, if it's Miles Morales, a totally different Spider-Man, and take his things and put him into Peter Parker, because they're thinking of what's the best way we can do the movie now. We're not thinking about, you know, 30 years from now, whether or not, like, ooh, are we going to do a Miles Morales or not? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Yeah. They're going to mine that, all that good material now. Okay, what's next? All right, this one comes from Andre Aroyan, who writes, since some of you will be watching Rogue One on Saturday, should I not watch Movie Talk next week in, uh, and go into the movie fresh? <laughs> Um, okay, look, we are not going to spoil anything. I mean, the review embargo lifts on Tuesday morning. So as of Tuesday, we're going to put up our review. We'll probably talk about whether we like or didn't like the movie, but we will not be giving spoilers of any kind. Now, of course, we're going to put up a spoiler review on probably Thursday that or, or Friday morning when the film opens so that people who have seen the movie can watch and talk about the movie with us. 
But no, you'll be totally fine watching Movie Talk. You'll be totally fine watching our non-spoiler review. You'll just find out whether we like it or not. And look, unless you decide to dig a hole in your backyard and bury yourself <laughs> under it, you're going to hear if people liked or didn't like Star Wars before it opens. You're just going to hear that. That's all you're going to hear from us. Dennis, should I add anything to that? Yeah, just that we're going to have our non-spoiler non -spoiler review version coming out, I think, on Tuesday. Tuesday morning Tuesday, at 9 that's when the, Pacific, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when the embargo lifts. So you can watch that if you want. You don't have to. And no, we don't. We're not going to run around here spoiling stuff for people. Yeah. Yeah, oh, my God. Did you see what Jar did? No. Yeah. Yeah. Please, 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 please God, don't. Please, God, don't. <laughs> All right. Last question of the day. All right. Last question actually comes from Cody Miller. What's up, Cody? Two-time hey. Olympic hey. gold medalist Cody Miller? Yeah. I All love right. Cody Miller. And he writes, how about an Oscar streaming service or on-demand service? Could go online a day after nomination day, possibly grow award viewing audience and give more widespread recognition for smaller budget award films. Well, I mean, it really depends on when the film was released. Like if the film gets released the week before the Oscars in wide release and you don't want to put it on a streaming service, I get that. But for a lot of these movies, these smaller movies that are getting awards recognition, why not take advantage of all the spotlight they're going to have on them as a result of getting Academy Award nominations if they already came out earlier that year to have a specific, you know, maybe a one week window where you have an Oscar streaming service that for, hey, for 10 bucks, you can watch this Oscar nominated award that may not be out on home video at this point, but you can watch it now. The studios profit, the fans benefit. It boosts the interest in the mm -hmm. awards themselves. So now if people see more of the movies, they'll be more vested in the show itself when the Oscars actually air. I think it's a win, win, win. I, I think it's a terrific idea. What do you think? I love the sound of that idea just because I love the idea of people getting to see all the nominated movies. But now I'm kind of picturing studios talking to each other and, oh, what if we, we stream before you? That's not fair. Mm -hmm. We should be first. You should be last. And it's all these competing entities. I like the idea. I don't know if it could ever work, sadly. Yeah, unless, I, yeah. Unless there will be problems. There will be issues. Unless you just stre streamed like all of Paramount's movie and, and they right. did it by themselves. Right. And maybe like every day we get a different studio or something. Yeah, what do you that, think? that would be, I agree. Great idea. Would love to do it. Cody, shout out. But like the the idea of this idea of the of the studios being okay, because then they'll argue which film's on the front, which film's first, which film's second. Like, there'll be all of that. You know how it works. And yeah. it'll be all of that being factored in. You'd hope everyone would just put away and put away their egos and let the, the films go up and let, but you could do it through Netflix. You could do it through streaming services that are already established for a week. These are all released on Netflix. You can watch them anytime you want, blah, blah, blah. And it's great. I mean, Netflix does multiple studios anyway, so they must have some kind of game plan to be able to do this or blueprint to be able to do this. So you hope it's possible. I think it's a great idea. I just, I'm not sure if it's possible with Dennis. studios. Yeah, design. not only does Cody Miller have an Olympic gold medal, he has great ideas for uh, streaming services. <laughs> yeah. I, it sounds like something I would totally subscribe to, especially mm. if it's just like a month or two, two or three months around the award seasons where yeah. it gets people caught up because there's a lot of things that people want to see. They just can't see it all. They don't have access to it. They can't go to the theater every single time. I think it's a, it's a great idea. Obviously, there would be a lot of logistics to work out, but it, I, I think it could get done. Especially for young parents, right, who always complain they can't get out to the theater. This is a great way for them to be involved <laughs> in the process now. You know, some, some of them only see one or two or three films a year because they have to worry about babysitters and children and all that kind of jazz. And don't they legit could don't, do this for shorts, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I think yeah. they have done it for sure. I, yeah. think, I know in New York they've done things where they've screened all the shorts yes, in like in IFC theater, or something, right, right. but they should do and a stream iTunes, of all of them. I think them. iTunes. Did, they, do they wrong. release a I package? Think, where I think you can iTunes buy? did that last year, hmm. where it's like all the short films and stuff like that you could do and stream. I think there's opportunity there, but there are hurdles that would yeah. have to be overcome. Okay, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. A lot of trailers talking. What a week for trailers! <laughs> Transformers, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, what else? Oh, oh. Or Fifty Shades. Don't yeah, forget yeah. about that. Then yeah. three big ones. Anyway, Dennis, where can people find you online? Well, you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Here on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Make sure to follow me and John and some of the rest of the crew this weekend, tomorrow night. <laughs> we're going to the Star Wars Rogue One premiere. I'm sure we're going to put a lot of pictures out, live stream. Probably face, do some Facebook live streaming as well. Yeah, probably. From there. So just follow us there. And yeah, I'm super, super excited for that. Mr. John Roca, where can people find you? <laughs> hey guys, you can always find me at The Roca Says, T H E R O C H A, as you see it there. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram, on Twitter there. You can also please download The Cinephiles. We just did a bunch of great new episodes of movies that you've known, classic movies, and also every Wednesday, 1 p.m., Super Animation Game Time. Me and Yuri Lowenthal interviewing up somebody from the world of 
uh, video games and animation over at uh, Geek and Sundry's Twitch channel and Walking Dead over every night. It's not this weekend, but certainly next year when we come back on Sundays to break it down uh, and have a good time. No, no, talking no, it's on this weekend. Well, I mean, not with me on it. Yeah, so, yes. but you'll oh, have, so people you'll have a better job. Now. You'll, have a, you'll have a more established job. Not on it. Oh, I'm not watching this anymore. <laughs> and, of course, Perry. You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff, and I will be spamming you on those this weekend. Exorcist tonight from Collider Nightmares. Tomorrow we got the Rogue One premiere, then Critics' Choice Awards on Sunday. There's going to be too many pictures for you guys. Also, Collider Nightmares every Wednesday morning, and there's also After Ash airing Sunday night, and it's the season finale, so the very last episode. Check that out. Of course, over there, we got Sinead DeFries. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm online at Sinead DeFries, and at that's Sinead.com, here on Mondays hosting TV Talk, and Fridays hosting Movie Talk, and hosting Mailbag over the weekend. And of course, Wendy Lee. Laughing at the comments, everybody's talking about Roka's scarf. You can find me me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And hey, if you really want to tap into a lot of stuff that we're going to be doing social media wise tomorrow night, whatever, make sure you're following Collider Video on Instagram. We can put up a lot of pictures there, video, the whole bit. Make sure if you're not already doing it, go over to Instagram, make sure you're following Collider Video there. You, of course, can follow me on social media on Facebook and on Twitter simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for being here with us today and until next time bye bye hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider